I have been crafting my pixel art skills for years and years and years. So today, in a single video, I'm going to teach you everything you need to get started with and actually not suck at pixel art, especially when it comes to making pixel art for games. We're gonna start at ground zero with software and setup and then transition into line work and colors and all the fun stuff. First things first, you need a place to actually do the pixel art, so you need a software. Aceprite is the go-to for me and many other pixel artists because it has super nice UI. You can do animations really nice it's got sprite sheets, tile sets, a lot of things built for making games. It is $20, technically, but because it's open source, you can find it online for free pretty easily. But you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> what? Who told you that? Libre Sprite is kind of the like go-to recompiled version. It's just an older version of Ace Sprite. It's basically the same thing. Try that out, see if you like it, and then eventually, you know, support the developers, be good. But if you're not feeling a sprite, you can usually configure Photoshop for pixel art pretty easily, or you can go to this website called Piskel. Nice, so now you have a place to actually draw things. But we're actually not going to be picking the colors to draw with ourselves. In fact, right now the goal is to avoid swatching or mixing our own colors completely. And that's because we're going to be automating the entire process using AI. I'm <laughs> Just kidding. A lot of pixel art tutorials out there are gonna try and teach you color theory and how to mix and shift your colors and all that. My advice is to not really worry about that right now because you don't have to. Instead, you can find a palette online that someone else made that's designed to look good so that you can actually focus on the fundamentals and get good at drawing. And then eventually, if you wanna learn color theory, you can do that. So this website called Lowspec is gonna be our best friend. They've got all kinds of color palettes. You can sort by the number of colors that you want and it's all specifically for pixel art, which is really good because pixel art palettes usually need more contrast than traditional palettes. And right now we're just looking for a palette that has at least three shades per color. And that's because when we shade our pixel art, we're gonna want three colors per material as a general rule. We're gonna talk about that later, but as you're browsing low spec or you're, you're looking at my screen as I browse low spec, there's some really cool stylized palettes here that are really good for game jams in my opinion when you're you need a strong identity but for now we just want a nice big general palette the one that i used is linked in the description if you're an a sprite then there's actually a bunch of pre-made palettes in a sprite that you can download you can just click this button and then i would recommend something like this one or you can find one on low spec import it and then set it to be your default palette by clicking these three lines and then save as default palette Perfect, now we have all the tools we need to actually draw something. My workflow when it comes to doing pixel art is to start with the outline of what I'm doing, then fill in that outline with solid base colors, and then shade it. That could mean starting with construction lines for your outline and then using those to map out the proportions of what you're drawing. But another approach is to map out the basic shapes that make up whatever you're drawing. And then you can mold that into your outline, which gives you a really nice silhouette. Whatever strategy speaks to you, try it out. But when you do start working, you might notice that your pixels look pretty thick. These lines look a little bit chunky, especially when we're trying to use them to make a nice clean outline. That's because we're using something called doubles. Doubles are the extra pixels that are generally unnecessary and they make your pixel art look really sharp because it's a bunch of right angles. When we get rid of our doubles, our pixel art is a lot more readable and it's a lot cleaner. In Acebrite, you can actually toggle this setting called Pixel Perfect, and now all of your lines will not automatically have doubles on them. Now, sometimes we do want doubles in order to bring more structure to a certain shape or as a style choice. It usually comes across as really retro and bold, but you gotta keep it intentional. If it's inconsistent, then it's just gonna look messy. And speaking of messy lines, look at this. Now, this line doesn't have any doubles, but it does look really jagged, especially when we look at it from afar. So how do we fix it? Great question, subscriber. Because I know you're subscribed, right? Well, we want to make sure that each pixel here is smoothly transitioning to the next one. An easy way to do that is to count your pixels and repeat the same segment length on either side of a curve, usually keeping it symmetrical. Like this one follows a nice little pattern, so it looks really nice, it's buttery smooth. And even if you don't have a big curve, if it's a small line, you can still apply this principle to make it look cleaner. It's really all about just gradually building up or down the number of pixels that you're using to make your line. Whenever I'm drawing a curve, even if it's barely a curve, I start with the two opposite ends of what I'm joining, and then fill in the pixels to make them meet in the middle. So now you know how to make smooth and clean pixel art without using doubles and without having jagged, ugly lines. Now, remember how I said earlier, we want three colors per material when we're coloring things in? That's because we have a base color, a shadow, and then a highlight. Now, if you're using a palette, ideally you already have those, so you don't have to worry about mixing it yourself, like I said earlier. But if you do wanna level up your coloring even more, 
consider shading or highlighting with a different color than your base. For example, if we look at the portrait of Penny from Stardew Valley, who is the most boring NPC in the entire game, by the way. Sorry, not sorry. Her base hair color is orange because she's a ginger, but then the highlights are yellow and the shadows are purple. It isn't just light orange, dark orange, and that makes the colors look a lot more vivid. So if you go to Google and then search color shading guide, you're gonna get a bunch of examples of what colors to shade what. Okay, I know that I said I wasn't gonna talk about color theory, but I feel like I need to give you a little bit better of an explanation than that. You totally can just Google it, but the reason that this works is because of analogous colors, and those are just any colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. So if I'm coloring with red, and that's my base color, I can highlight with orange, and then I can shade with purple because those are analogous colors of red. And if I'm doing green, I'm gonna highlight with yellow, and then I'll shade with blue. <laughs> But no matter what, I like to start by doing my base color, and then I do my shadows, and then I add my highlights. But wait a second, Juniper, this is ugly. You are so right, Queen, and that's because I'm shading without thinking about where my light source is coming from. So instead, I'm just kind of wrapping shadows around the outline of my art, which doesn't look good, and it kind of looks like a pillow which is why this is called pillow shading. It's really easy to do on accident if you're not thinking about a light source, because how else do you know where to put the shadows? So if I take this same piece of art, but now I decide that the light is gonna be coming from this angle, now I kind of have an idea of where I should put my shadows. So before you really start shading anything, you should ask yourself where the light is coming from. And if you're making art for a game, you probably want to keep that angle of light consistent across all of your sprites. Now, a lot of pixel art games are top-down or usually drawn in a three-fourths view or an oblique view. That means you can usually see the top of what you're drawing as well as the front of it. So the light source in these games is usually coming from the top of the screen and then casting forward and down. So there's light on the front of everything, but it's ultimately most well-lit on the top. This kind of thinking is also what helps you think about perspective when you're drawing. If you're drawing a table and a chair for your game, you want to make sure that the angle of light is the same for both of those. But you also got to ask yourself, how much of each object should I see? Even if my chair is shorter than my table, I should still see the same amount of the top of the chair as the top of the table. Unless, of course, the table is more narrow than the chair, and I want to show that. All of those details are what makes pixel art really shine. And if you're watching this because you want to make pixel art for games, then think about today's sponsor, Game Maker. Game Maker is a game development engine designed to help you make high quality 2D games quickly, whether they're pixel art or not. This is a game called The King is Watching, and it was made in Game Maker. It's a roguelike kingdom builder that came out about a month ago. All of this beautiful pixel art, the graphics, the UI, the gameplay, it's all powered by Game Maker. And the same thing goes for this co-op island survival game called Tinkerlands. It's fast, it's efficient, you're not gonna be spending 10 years following tutorials on how to navigate the engine. Huh? Cause look, I've been using Game Maker for a long time now. Back in the day, four years ago, I started with one of the many Game Maker tutorials that they have published on their channel, like this RPG one. I taught myself pixel art along the way, I joined their Discord server where I got all the help that I needed, and here we are. Because you, single-handedly, all on your lonesome, can release a game using Game Maker. So download Game Maker for free, by the way, using my link in the description. So when you're shading, you want to think about light source, you want to think about perspective, but shading doesn't even necessarily mean that one color makes up all of your shadows. There's a lot of cool ways you can shade or even manipulate the outline of your piece to exaggerate light. Dithering, for example, is when you create kind of a pattern with two colors to give the illusion of a third color. It's usually like a checker pattern between two colors, but it doesn't have to be. This is how they shaded things on older consoles when they literally didn't have space to add another color. But nowadays it can be a really cool stylistic choice, it can show texture, or it can break up a really big area of shadow. You've also got anti-aliasing as an option, which kind of smooths or blends lines. You grab a color that's in between two colors you're wanting to blend together and place those pixels along the corners, only the corners, of your piece. You're kind of creating a gradient that almost looks like a shadow, but one that is very soft and very subtle. Anti-aliasing kind of makes pixel art look less like pixel art since you're removing a lot of the sharpness. It's really up to you whether you like it or not, it definitely takes some getting the hang of. But in my opinion, I think it gives art a really nice polished look. 
Now, another option when you're coloring is to change the way you're coloring your outline. Whenever I make pixel art, I usually start with like a solid black outline around whatever I'm drawing, but by the end of it, it's almost always recolored somehow or I just got rid of it. Because first off, your outline doesn't have to be black. When you're looking at Stardew Valley, you're gonna notice that everything has a different color outline and it's pretty much just a darker version of whatever the object is. Plants have dark green outlines, wood has dark brown or dark orange outlines, or you can look at something like Omori where they use this really bright purple outline, and that gives it a really dreamlike and iconic style. In a game environment, you can also play around with an inconsistent outline style in order to draw focus to different things. Look at how the player in Celeste has an outline, but nothing else in the background does. The house still has shading, and also look at how it uses brown, but then the shadows are purple. That's, that's the color thing I was talking about earlier. But looking at the big picture, only the interactable objects have an outline. Even the ground and the platforms don't have outlines because that would make the characters stand out less. It's a similar story with AK Zolotl, but this time the characters have outlines and so does everything else in the world, except the player, the items, and the NPCs, they have a black outline and everything else is a dimmer, darker brown. So keeping things the same, like lighting and perspective is good, but you have a lot more freedom with outline and color and you can actually use it to guide the player and give your game an identity. It's definitely worth it to look at some of your favorite pixel art games and try and pay attention to what they're outlining and how they're guiding your eyes to the right things and not making things too busy. But that's just, that's some food for thought if you're making a game. But anyway, another way that you can color your outline is by shading it depending on where the light is coming from. The side of an object that's closest to the light could be a lot lighter and then, you know, vice versa for the shadowed side. When it comes to creating an art style though, you can also think about the size of your outline. You can look at how the earlier version of Tinkerlands used to look with a really thick outline or Hyper Light Drifter which has no outline. The art in Hyper Light Drifter is so pretty, but it also must have been so hard because to not use an outline means that, first off, your character has to be super readable in the environment still, which usually means making them significantly lighter or darker than their surrounding space. And also, you need to have really defined shapes so that it's still readable without a clear outline. Anyway, so far we've talked about clean line work, perspective, shading, colors, everything to consider when you're making an art style. So now it's time for a bunch of miscellaneous tips and tricks that I don't really know how to categorize, but I think they're important nonetheless. Tip number one, if your art looks bad and it's not because of the line work, take a look at your colors. Do you have more than three colors per material? And if so, is it necessary? I did a video forever ago, God, I, I look like a fetus, but I did a video a while ago where I critiqued the pixel art that you guys sent in. And a common problem was having way too many colors. The beauty of pixel art comes from its boldness and from its simplicity. So using too many shades of the same color usually just makes something look really noisy and harder to look at. So unless you're doing that like super intentionally, probably not great. Tip number two, use references. Same as traditional art, right? If you're making a pirate, you probably want to look at some pictures of pirates. However, we do live in 2025, unfortunately, which means if I'm drawing a horse and then I search horse, I get to play the game of, is this a real horse? So my recommendation to circumvent that is to go to Pinterest, which in my opinion has a lot less AI for now. Tip number three, zoom mm. out. Speed paints of me doing pixel art are genuinely schizophrenic because every three seconds I am zooming in and out of the canvas. But the reason I do that is because it matters a lot more how something will look from far away and it can look very different up close versus far away. You want to try and make sure that you're refreshing your eyes with the size that you'll actually be seeing something on screen, especially if it's a small character in a game. In a sprite, you can actually press F7 and that'll give you a little preview window and then in that window you're able to zoom out so you don't have to be doing it manually every five seconds like me. Tip number four, you can't do art just because you want to get good at it. Nah, you gotta do it for the love of the game. Same thing with making YouTube videos, honestly, or making a game. You can't do it because you want the output of having a finished product, because then you're not gonna have any motivation when you start learning and suck and realize you suck because you just started learning. Having goals? Great. Expecting high things of yourself? Fantastic. But realistically, you will not put in all the time that it takes to get to that point unless you can also learn to like making art, not just having made good art. But all of that being said, 
you got it. You're going to be fine. Hopefully something helped you out in this video. And if it did, maybe subscribe. That would, <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Or you can join my game development Discord server if you want a little community where you can share your stuff. And seriously, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.